Tony and Jenny Brisky from Real Ghost Stories Online. You know, we love doing the show for you every single week, but doing the show is not free. So if you enjoy the show, we ask maybe you uh, consider helping us out a bit and supporting it. You can do that by becoming an EPP at realghoststoriesonline.com. EPP means extra podcast person. You get an extra podcast for your support of the show. Every single week, we send you a brand new one. And you get access to our past archive of EPP episodes as well. Right now, that's more than 15 bonus episodes along with the weekly episode that you'll be getting every single week for only five bucks a month. If you like the show, help keep us on the air. And become an EPP at realghoststoriesonline.com today. And thank you. Welcome to Real Ghost Stories Online. Call in your real ghost story now at 855-853-4802 or write in at realghoststoriesonline.com. You're about to enter the world of the unknown and quite possibly the undead. This is Real Ghost Stories Online. And Merry Christmas to all on tonight's episode of Real Ghost Stories Online. A young girl recounts a fateful Christmas day and describes her death and the death of her family. It's a touching Christmas tale that can be recounted for years to come around the kitchen dinner table around the holidays with friends and family and children. Well, if it's one of those stories that if you think your family's bad, <laughs> yeah. after that story, you'll it's think true. it's not so bad. It'll make everything f put into perspective, and that's the special story that uh, Jenny has put together, and she'll be reading for us in just a few moments. Years after a faulty wiring on a Christmas tree sparks a fire that kills dozens, the voices and visions of young children that perished remain. Grandparents feel a special bond with their grandchildren, so much so that they sometimes return from the dead just to introduce themselves. Those stories, your calls, and more on today's special Christmas edition of Real Ghost Stories Online. Tony and Jenny Bruski joining you once again. Hi. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. It's, uh, I think we're like one of the few shows that actually does a Christmas episode on Christmas. Oh, really? Yeah, I don't think anybody else really does at all. <laughs> but we have listeners who I know, you know, we are listening to it so many odd hours and times and just to kind of get away from it all. I think it's good to do a Christmas show. That's why I was really kind of like, yeah, let's do a Christmas show. Well, there's few days that are wonderful as Christmas, yet also stressful as sure. Christmas. So I think you're right. I think it's good to provide a little outlet from mm -hmm. whatever stress may be going on. It's yeah, it's not you know to yeah. just do like a rerun of the episode, or you can. This is a fresh episode for you today here on Christmas, so you can enjoy it. And maybe you're, you're listening to it, like I said yesterday, the Fourth of July. Sure. But uh, we have a lot of folks who who get the first runs of the show. So uh, so Merry Christmas to you. Thank you for uh, for spending your holiday with us. We really do uh, do appreciate and are honored to be part of uh, maybe your new Christmas tradition, listening to ghost stories. Ooh, that would be neat. Yeah, it'd be kind of fun, you know? And especially, I mean, I, obviously this is not necessarily a show for young children by any stretch of the imagination, so don't play it for children. But if you got older kids, you know, like teenagers or something, sure, this is totally, you know, it's, uh, it's up everyone's alley. But speaking of that, mm -hmm. we've kicked around the idea of maybe around Halloween, this coming Halloween, mm -hmm. doing a show geared just for kids. Sure, like one episode mm -hmm. around Halloween, uh, maybe not the Halloween episode, but, no. but near Halloween, yeah. where we could release one that's just, uh, or, or is appropriate for, it was something everyone can all enjoy. It's not sure. going to be like Casper the Ghost Stories, but it'll be stories that everyone can enjoy gone through with a fine tooth comb yeah. and all the profanities changed and it's nothing that's going to be terrifying i won't curse at all I'll just say fudge like on a christmas story you won't <laughs> even do that <laughs> why does he keep saying fudge did he get a lot of fudge for halloween yes that's right <laughs> little jimmy that's exactly what happened no i think it'd be fun i think it'd be a good thing to do i think so but uh today's uh christmas episode not so much for the kids no <laughs> so, not really uh but please do uh enjoy it uh the phone number is 855-853-4 8802. Of course, if you have a real ghost story you'd like to share with us. If you like the show, be sure to tell your friends, your family about it. Uh, maybe around the dinner table today uh, or uh, in uh, one of the get-togethers you're, uh, you're participating in. Uh, it helps us grow the show. And we do greatly appreciate that. So uh, to kick off the show today, we have a, uh, a special Christmas tale. And this is based on a true story, right? I call it faction. It's, it's a fiction 
based on a historical event. Okay. So fiction based on fact. And after the story is told, we can talk a little bit more about the event itself and, yeah. and some of the ghost tales and some of the information that you, you gathered. Uh-huh. Okay. I don't want to give anything away. Okay. So, so we'll talk more about that after. I, I found some nice creepy musical selections for the background of this. Is it going to distract me? I don't think so. I mean, it's... Since you're making me read it, I'd rather you read it. I, I think you did a great job with it because it, you have the nice southern accent there. It's a story from the south. If the music distracts you, just take the headphones off. But it's, it's just this, this nice creepy piano music. Yep, that's creepy. Yeah, I thought it would set the mood for this. All right. Okay. All right. Do you have a title for this at all? No, I didn't <laughs> think to do that. <laughs> okay. Well, that's, you don't need a title for it. We'll just read the story. And this is this is a Christmas tale. And if it's horrible, I promise to never write a ghost it's story. It's not horrible. I listened to it yesterday. It's good. You're going to all enjoy it. So here you go. Here's your little Christmas treat from Jenny Bruski at Real Ghost Stories Online. Okay. Folks in town said Papa could read the fields. He knew exactly when to plant and when to harvest. Sometimes he could even sense when winter of North Carolina had one more cold spell in her. Farming was his life, and Papa was good at growing tobacco. We would sometimes spend all day in the fields. Sometimes he'd come in mad and yell at us kids. One morning, Papa was out in the field when the mules started acting up. I don't rightly know what happened, but Papa got hurt in his head. Even after he got better, he just seemed different. Raising us youngins was Mama's work. Fanny was Mama's name, and boy, could she bake. Even when she was looking after all seven of us, she'd bake a Christmas cake that would knock your socks off. Mama was a nice lady, but she always seemed a little sad. I reckon she missed my big brother Billy, who went to be with the Lord. I recall it was Christmas Day. Papa was really quiet all morning, and he'd told us to get ready. We were going to town. We all squealed with excitement. We didn't know what Papa had planned, but for us, all us kids to get to go to town was special. When we got to town, we all got new clothes. Mama was real surprised. Usually she had to make our clothes, or had to mend one of Marie's dresses, my big sister, so I could wear it to school. I picked out a brand new pretty white dress with flowers on it. It was the whitest dress I'd ever seen. We were all so happy. After we got the new clothes, Papa told us that we were going to sit for a portrait. Mama gave Papa a funny look. I felt like rich folk. Even the minister taking the, Mr. taking the picture thought it was funny. This sure was a special day. When we got back to the farm, Maybelle and me wanted to go tell our aunt and uncle about the special day we'd had in town. My brother Arthur headed back to town to get some supplies Papa said he needed. After Mama had us put our nice new dresses away, we headed down the road past the barn. We were still talking about our dresses when I heard a gunshot. I looked over and Maybelle was lying on the ground. She's covered in blood. Then all of a sudden I fell down too. I felt cold all over and couldn't keep my eyes from closing. When I woke up, I felt strange. I stood up and looked around and I could see Papa. He was in the barn, but what didn't make sense was Maybell was lying on the ground in the barn. But I saw me too. We were both covered in blood. Papa was still talking to us, but we couldn't say nothing. He put a couple of rocks under our heads like pillows and then grabbed his gun. I looked over and I saw Maybell standing next to me. We stood there crying, looking at our bodies. We figured we were dead. Maybell and I watched as Papa killed everybody. He shot them, then he hit them. He always felt bad after each time because he'd put a pillow under their heads so they were comfortable while they waited for heaven. After we were all dead, Papa took his gun and headed off to the woods. That was the last time I saw Papa. Soon the town folk came from to the farm to see what happened. They must have heard Papa's gun and thought something was wrong. Arthur came home, but it was too late. We all heard one last shot from the woods. 
Papa felt real bad about what he'd done. He wanted to die too. I got to wear my pretty dress again. The undertaker dressed us all in our new clothes for the funeral. We each got our own casket except for Mary Lou. She got buried with Mama because she was the baby. We were all buried together, but the preacher said we couldn't be buried in the graveyard. We were all laid together, even Papa. There was lots of talk at the burial. People were saying that Papa and Marie had been too close and Mama didn't like it. Marie's best friend, Mayella, thought that Marie was going to have a baby. I don't know nothing about Papa and Marie. I went back to the farm after they buried us. It was too quiet. No sound of us kids playing or Mama singing. No smell of cake bacon. For a while, it was just empty. Uncle Mary and Papa's brother thought it would be a good way to make money if he let people see where we died. It's strange that people will pay good money to see something so sad. Some folks even took things from the house or pieces of wood from the barn. They all talked that things would be worth money someday. I kind of got to looking forward to the town folk that would come out to the farm. Sometimes Maybelle and I would go up to them or run around them. A couple of times I thought a lady or two could see me. Some folk took pictures of the house, and I'd always smile for the camera. I just tried to cheer them up. They always seemed so sad. After a while, Uncle Marion stopped letting people visit. The house was start starting to fall apart. I remember watching the house fall down. There wasn't nothing left. People came and took boards from the house. The floorboards went to build a bridge. Folks thought it would save the county some money to use the wood again. I didn't have a house no more. Maybelle and I went to the bridge. It was all we had left. Sometimes as a game, we would touch the cars as they crossed. People would get scared when they saw our handprint on the window, but we didn't mean no harm. We stayed with the bridge a long time. Bridge is gone now, too. There's nothing at all where we used to live. But I'm still here, and my story's still here. Well, that's a touching <laughs> tale for Christmas. Did you like it? I did. I did like it. Now, this is a story that is based on, on fact and yeah. actual hauntings. Mm -hmm. that uh, uh, some of these accounts of the, the bridge being haunted and handprints on the windows of cars and such, and you did some research into this to, yeah. to, to put all this together and the story and essentially what is, uh, I don't want to say an urban legend because there is, this is based on fact. It's not just, oh, there might have been a family, this or here. This is, there was a family. This documented happened. And, you know, obviously there's some assumption there that when people have handprints on this, their car that or by this bridge that had the wood from that house, the assumption is that maybe the children from that house. Right. Did, okay. Right. This was taken. I, I took liberty of writing this from Carrie's perspective. She was the 12 year old da daughter. She was their fourth child. The third one had died. Okay. Billy. William. But anyway, um. So I figured that she was probably old enough to tell the story, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, still young enough to have an innocent take on it. Sure. But back in 1929, Charlie Lawson murdered his entire family with the exception of his oldest son. He sent his son back to town and nobody understands why he mm -hmm. saved his son. Um, they're not real sure why he went on this rampage. There's the rumor of something going on between him and his oldest daughter. That's just a rumor. There's mm -hmm. a rumor that he possibly witnessed something to do with some kind of organized crime and, you know, sure. that it really wasn't a murder. There's a lot of different rumors. The yeah. thing is, nobody understands what happened. Okay. Um, and so after the murders and the burial and everything, they opened the house up as a tourist attraction and charged a quarter for people to go through it. As like just morbid like this is a house of the murder or was it like this is a haunted house no this is the murder house okay. and you can see the blood on the floor 
Okay. Um, even the cake that Fanny was making that day Jesus. was still there. Somebody put like a, a cake dome over it and people could still see it sitting there. I mean, there, it, even to the time the boards were used for the bridge, there was still blood stains on them. God. So. Oh, the things we did before iPads. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you see, this is what this is a good thing. People complain about, oh, techno. We're not doing that anymore. We're not going to murder houses. Well, some people are. But it's not like, uh, hey, let's put the kids in the car and go down there and check it out. <laughs> but, you know, a quarter is a lot of money in the middle of the Depression. Sure. Yeah, so and that was not cheap to go and check out this house. No. So, I mean... Who he, was he, it? A, was it a family member that was yeah. doing the house? Yeah, oh, it, that's was, even it was Charlie's there. brother opened it up as a tourist attraction. Jeez. So anyway, so that happened. Um, there was lots of accounts of seeing um, apparitions of children there on the farm while mm -hmm. people were, to were touring the farm. And um, they, you know, would feel dread, feel all kinds of sure. negative energy. I don't know if it was related to it being haunted or if it was mm -hmm. just knowing that this is where this entire family was massacred. Sure. I mean, just knowing that going into a place like that almost immediately puts that feeling into your, you know, the pit of your stomach. Sure. But you know? there was a lot of people that took pictures that claimed that they saw extra children in the pictures. And Did you see any of the pictures at all? Were any of them online? Not, or? not the ones from the the tourists okay so no and um no pictures of the handprints from the cars going across the bridge sure but i just couldn't find a really good take on the story mm -hmm. to share just reading it so i thought well i'll just get the facts and write my own i guess sure you still had a little southern accent there when you were talking about it. I still have a little southern accent anyway. Well, you do, but it came out more in the story. It was supposed to. Sure. Because it happened yeah. in, in the South. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think you did a really good job. Thank you. That was a very, very interesting take on a story. You should do more of those from time to time. Mom. I don't know. We'll see the reception that we get. If people <laughs> are like, just stick to the other ones, the real ones, then... We'll just do that. And I'll block their IP addresses and tell them never to come back again. That's not nice. No, I want honest <laughs> feedback. I thought it was, was fun. I thought it was a really interesting kind of fun thing to do for uh, for the holidays. So thank you for putting that together. I know that took some time. No problem. So 855-853-4802 is our phone number here at uh, Real Ghost Stories Online. Of course, you can always write in your Real Ghost Story uh, to our website at Real Ghost Stories Online. Dot com. Let's go to uh, Maggie. Maggie writes in the tragedy, or this tragedy happened on December 22nd of 1951. There was a big Christmas party for children living in poverty, and they were to receive gifts, food, and everything that a Christmas party implies. This was taking place in a multi-purpose room located in a three-story building. The first floor was used as a small movie theater, and the third floor was the multi-purpose room. I don't know for what uh, the second floor was for. At about 10 p.m., the operator of the movie theater was informed that there was smoke coming out of the multi-purpose room, and he hurried to get the people out of the theater. They could get out safely, but unfortunately, the children, some local personalities, and other adults didn't. The four emergency exits were shut, so there was only one door available to escape the fire. It was started by a malfunction of the Christmas tree, and the fire spread rapidly. That night, about 100 people died, and probably there was uh, many injured attendants. There was not enough ambulances, so taxi drivers helped by taking people to hospitals. Also, firefighters from National City, San Diego, and uh, Chula Vista of California uh, helped putting out the fire. I had to give you the whole background before getting into the ghostly stuff. The place is still there, and so some brave inhabitants dare to call it home. It looks dreadful from the outside, and once you walk in, there's some kind of pressure on the chest that, unless you are familiar with the paranormal, makes it hard to remain calm. You can still see the damage of the fire. For some reason, it was never repaired. At first sight, you know that there is something extraordinary going on in that building. I visited the place and talked to some of the people who are currently living there. All of them agreed to have seen or heard strange things at different times of the day. A lady who had been living in the Coliseum for the last 15 years confirms that she has seen a bunch of children rushing to one of the rooms and then disappear inside. Also, she states that sometimes at night you can hear screaming in the room where the fire started. I tried to capture some ghosts or any evidence of what happens there, but I was unlucky. However, the feeling of sadness and dread are enough evidence for me. 
That's a place to go visit, I guess. No, I'm not sure I'd want to go visit that. I can't believe people are living in there. Yeah. You know, I, I'm just shocked like a place like that hasn't just been torn down. I know. That, that story reminded me of another haunting I heard about, and I'm trying to find the name of the theater. It was a massive theater fire yeah. in the early 1900s. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess it's, maybe it's like a, registered as a historic building or something. I wonder, did they, do you know if they like redid the theater and reused it as a theater for years after before it was converted into homes or anything or apartments, I wonder? In this story? In this story. No, yeah. I don't. Uh, I'd love to do some more research on that one because that is just a creepy, intriguing story. You know, it's, it's interesting, like at this day and age, I would think that they would just tear the building down. You know, you have, like, serial killers or things of that nature. Um, sometimes their home's not even used for the murders being taken place, but half the time when they're caught, their residences are destroyed and torn down because people don't want to have anything to do with the association. Sure. And I'm not just talking about BTK here. I'm talking about, like, Jeffrey Dahmer's apartment. I mean, there's some sick shit that went on there. But, um, you know, just tragedy. You know, that, that struck, you know, and, and this is obviously you know, a serial killer and a tragedy of an accident is two totally different things. But still, just a tragic place. I'm surprised that they just didn't say, look, this building is just not fit to, you know, do anything in anymore. Well, al along those lines, the theater that I mentioned a little bit ago, yeah. it was the Iroquois Theater in Chicago. Okay. And in 1903, it was supposed to house 1,600 people to see a show. And there was over 2,000 in there. And it caught fire. Most of the people in attendance were women and children, and 600 of them died. Oh, God. And they tore the theater down, but they rebuilt another theater right on top of it. Okay. Because, you know, it was obviously... Prime real estate. Yeah, it was prime real estate. It was in too bad of shape to gut and redo. Sure. But it's a highly haunted theater. And I'm not sure the name of the theater that went on top of it. But they changed the name. But... Wow. You know, it just, it, it kind of reminded me of that one that we just yeah. read. In places like that where there's just so much death all at one time, I don't know, I, I can't imagine, I mean, I, I suppose it was a different time, you know, in the 20s and such, but today, I don't know, I, I can't imagine. Although, you know, this is morbid to talk about, but... Um, they did reopen, you know, the theater in, uh, was it Aurora? Colorado. Oh, they did? Yeah, that okay. theater's still there. I don't know if that specific room is shut off. That room might not be used anymore, but the rest of the theater is a functioning theater. You know, schools that have had mass shootings and such, and they still continue to use those buildings. You know, I suppose feasibility does play a big part into this, but gosh, I don't, I don't think I could... <laughs> as much as I like going into a creepy place... That just, to me, is, is would be too much. Well, and especially a place where children died. I mean, it's bad yeah. anytime anybody dies, but when children, you know, yeah. are faced with the, th the threat of dying in a fire, yeah. they aren't going to maybe have that moment of realization where an adult would be like, this is it. It's yeah. my time. The kid's just like... It's panic done. up yeah. until the last second, you yeah. know? So I think the energy left behind is that much more intense yeah there's no closure there at all not that there's that much for an adult but even less for a child and not every adult's gonna have that moment sure. where they are no. like okay i'm no. i'm done but a child for sure isn't yeah yeah that's true well happy uh happy stories here merry christmas everybody <laughs> hey you know what you're getting you're listening to real ghost stories online what did you expect <laughs> 855-853-4802 is our number. Kelly writes in, my encounters with the paranormal have mostly been unexciting, but this is perhaps the most interesting experience I've had. First of all, you need to know a little background to this story and the events that preceded it. I share the same name with my uh, uh, paternal grandfather's favorite older brother, who tragically perished while serving in the military during World War I. My grandfather was apparently very appreciative when he heard that my name, uh, what my name, my name was going to be, and my dad has said that he thought it established a special bond between the both of us. He was very fond of me when I was young. Sadly, though, we hardly got the chance to know each other. My dad was working 
as uh, in, uh, uh, what is this? In, uh, expatriate. Expatriate. Oh, oh, if I could read. Uh, expatriate in Southeast Asia when my grandparents lived in Melbourne, Australia. Traveling was not cheap. What is an expatriate? Maybe I'm just an idiot here, but I don't know what that is. Well, it, like we consider Americans that move to like France and Italy permanently or, you know, change to a different country. So it's not necessarily a job line. It's just more so uh, ex-resident. I, yeah. A way of describing residency. Yeah. Okay. I, I thought it meant like it was some sort of a, a profession, if you will. No. But, okay. Well, that's just me not knowing what I'm talking about. <laughs> Continuing on. Traveling was not cheap, and the distance between our two countries was quite long, so we saw each other um, uh, every two or three years, and my memory of my grandfather is quite vague. By the time I was 10, I had not seen my grandfather in four years. In 1991, that looked likely to change. My father accepted a job position in Sydney was preparing to relocate our family there. That meant he'd be able to see my paternal grandparents on a much more regular basis since we were both in that same country. We were all looking forward to this arrangement. I'll try to be brief about this, but I do want to emphasize that in the months leading up to our move to Australia, I started to get this strong instinct or feeling that we needed that time that was running out for my grandfather. Part of this may have been due to the common sense and what my parents had told me about him, that he had suffered from a series of strokes and that his health was deteriorating, although his short-term prognosis was not alarming. But it nevertheless was quite a strong feeling, and I remember having a dream about it one or two months before we were due to move. I later learned that my grandfather had exactly the same feeling that time was running out for him and had expressed to my dad a desire to see my mother and his grandchildren as soon as possible. When my dad told him we would visit him at Christmas, he gave my dad a distinct impression that he thought that he wouldn't be around that long. I'm not sure if there was some spiritual connection between our thoughts, but I was thinking of him on the night of his death. My grandfather died approximately 10 days before we moved to his country and we would have been closer to him. It was a deep blow for all of us because we were all looking forward to seeing him again. That Christmas, we all went down to visit my grandmother in Melbourne. The trip was supposed to have reunited us with both grandparents. I think we all felt a keen sense of loss and sadness that we were so close yet so far away from seeing my grandfather. My grandmother had moved out of her bedroom to accommodate us. It was the room which she had shared with my grandfather since they had moved into the house just over two decades ago. My mother and I were sharing that room while my dad and sister were sharing the other room. It was late on our first night there and my mother was in the bathroom getting ready for bed. I was alone playing with my toys when suddenly I heard a male voice coming from, the, or from near the cupboard by the window. It said, hello, Kelly. Welcome to Melbourne. I was frightened out of my wits. I knew I was alone in the room and that the voice wasn't supposed to be there. I ran out of the room. I can't remember if I was screaming, but I remember being distinctly frightened. My parents came and comforted me, and in the end, I went back to the room. My mother came in not long afterwards, and there were no further incidences that night. Despite what happened, it didn't deter me from spending time alone in that room after that. Afterwards, and even to this day, I feel very guilty about my reaction and being frightened and running out of the room, even though I accept that it was somewhat understandable that a 10-year-old with no experience of interacting with the paranormal would have that reaction. I have no doubt that the voice in question was that of my grandfather, and I strongly believe that one of the reasons that he was still in that room was because he had unfinished business in not having seen his grandchildren for so long before he died. My grandmother was not aware of all that had happened, and we decided not to tell her, for fear that it may upset or distress her. Sometime later, for whatever reason, my dad did tell her about my experience. My grandmother was a straightforward, no-nonsense type of person, and I felt sure that she would dismiss my story as ridiculous nonsense. To my great surprise, she implied to my dad that she had sensed his presence around and that it had been a while after his death before she finally felt that he had left to continue his journey to wherever the next life took him. Even though I reacted badly to that encounter with my grandfather, I'm grateful for having it and 
I am touched that my grandfather loved us enough to want to reach out to us from beyond the grave to make up for not being able to see us before he died. I love you, Grandpa, and may you rest in peace until we meet again on those distant shores of the afterlife. That's a really touching story. Mm -hmm. I don't know that if I were a a dead grandparent that I could resist the urge to try and contact my grandchild. I think, yeah, I'd definitely be doing it. <clears throat> yeah. And then I'd be hiding Skittles in odd places around the room. <laughs> what is this? Skittles. Grandpa left green Skittles again. Grandpa's hiding Skittles. I would totally do that. Because everyone loves Skittles. It puts a smile on your face when you have a Skittle. And I enjoy Skittles too. Give them the message to taste the rainbow. Taste the rainbow. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly what I would be doing. No, I mean, I, I, I would do something like that where it's kind of fun and kind of, you know, not going to freak the living hell out of them. But enough where it's like, well, that's odd. I know I didn't put a Skittle here. Yeah. You know, why are there Skittles in the cat's litter box? <laughs> Ew. <laughs> If you wash them, they're okay. No. 855-853-4802 is a phone number to call in to Real Ghost Stories online. Uh, and if you want more uh, Real Ghost Stories, I want to let you know about this uh, because over the next couple of uh, days here, we got some uh, best of episodes coming up for you. Some of the best ghost stories of the year put together uh, into uh, a string of some episodes. Uh, but if you want some brand, brand new episodes that you've never heard, well, become an EPP. You sign up at realghoststoriesonline.com. As soon as you sign up, that email goes directly to you with the latest EPP episodes in it, all 17 or 18 of them, depending on when you're signing up here. So uh, sign up there and you can binge listen to some fresh real ghost stories online. Uh, when you sign up on the website to, to realghoststoriesonline.com and of course at five bucks a month uh, supports the show and keeps us on the air as we enter into uh, year number two of Real Ghost Stories Online. Do we consider this year two that we're going into because the show was technically going on a bit last year, but not all that long. Well, the birthday for the show is in October. Sure. So we're in its second year because it turned one yeah. in October. So this is technically we're going into its third year. No, we're it's in its second its year. Second okay. year. It's ca its year is from October to October. It just has different years. So we cel just, we celebrate New Year's with the show in October. Just think of it as its birthday. That might be the easiest way for you to think of it. <laughs> I feel like you're talking to a Harper. <laughs> Sorry if I went into Just toddler mode. Think of it as, think of it as a choo choo going down the track. A choo choo. Yeah. Okay, I know, I know, I know. You know where I'm saying though. It's like I, I'm being with the year end okay, marker. Okay. Technically, many... the show started in 2013, so mm -hmm. we have a little bit of 2013, all of I, 2014. Oh, I know, I know, I know. Okay. Just making sure. <laughs> It's like the choo-choo goes in a circle. And if it didn't go in the whole circle, it's not a full... <laughs> That's how I describe things. And even I'm confused sometimes. 855-853-4802. Uh, Mandy writes in, When I was five, I lived in this house which was believed to be haunted. Since I was so young, I didn't really believe uh, this stuff because uh, at that age, kids sometimes think what people tell uh, you are made up. Uh, just a joke to scare you. It was Christmas Eve and everything was normal. I went to bed early so that Santa could come to my house faster. I laid awake in bed thinking about all the neat presents I'd be getting the next day. Did you ever have problems trying to sleep on Christmas Eve? Oh, yeah. I was not good at that. I could sleep pretty good most other nights. Christmas Eve, uh-uh. No, I was too excited. Did you ever, like, stay up the entire night? No. Okay. I usually passed out, but I would stay up way later just excited. Did you get up super early to get your stuff at all? Or did you have to wait till your parents got up? No, I could get up and go see before they got up. Yeah. Like, how early? What's the earliest you got up? Oh, probably six. It's late. No, I just... By the time I finally fell asleep... Yeah, you're probably out. I was out. I remember... Gosh... It probably had been like four or five when I was hitting it one year, a couple of years when I was about like seven or eight. Yeah. I remember getting up very early one morning, getting the Legend of Zelda, the original game, and the little gold cartridge for Nintendo, 
And this other one called Journey to Silas, which was real shitty and horrible. I think my dad got it like on a discount rack at, you know, KB Toys or something. He's like, oh, Tony, you'll like this. <laughs> it's totally my dad has a southern accent. Uh, but uh, but uh, I I did enjoy it. I mean, it's, it's one of those I look up to this day to like, I wonder if that's on an emulator somewhere. But uh, Zelda I loved. It was fun. But I remember like playing it at like four in the morning, shade still shut. The little like LCD VCR clock, you could see what time it was. I remember reading for something, and then like I think my mom wandering out, going, "Tony, are you out of bed?" Yeah, I got my Santa presents, and I, she didn't even care. It's like, okay, we're no, just don't make noise. Well, <laughs> we're yeah, seven or eight year old. Yeah, I'm not at all worried about. Yeah, it's like, fun. Livy coming up the stairs, that's fine. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's silly. That's one of my favorite. I think. Christmas Santa memories. I don't know. And I think I even probably knew at that point what the real deal was. I just wanted to play my video games. Now, did you always ask Santa what you asked Santa for gifts or did oh, yeah. you just tell Santa to surprise you? I told Santa detailed things. I mean, it was like a laundry list of things. Really? That's why I'm blown away by our girls when they go to Santa. It's like, oh, one thing. Okay. And then Harper's like, he's like, want any more? More than a bicycle? No, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I was like prepped. Yeah. No, uh, I always ask to be surprised. Really? There was one year, I remember I asked for a globe. I think I was five, and I got it. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the time, I just wanted to be surprised. I sat there. I probably had a good four or five minute conversation with Santa. I'm sure they hated it because they wanted to keep the kids moving and the line going at the mall. But I just sat there like rattling off a laundry list of things. You talking too much? No, no. not at all. And then I would like that I, as I was sitting there talking, my else my thought process was, okay, I know what I want, so I'm gonna go on this list of things and over describe everything just so he knows exactly what it is. And then I'd see other people carrying stuff through the mall, and I'd be like, oh, look at that, that would be nice too. Oh, good grief! Because I'm thinking Santa is an endless bounty of goods. <laughs> you were an asshole, kid. I wasn't an asshole. I was just very ambitious with what I thought I could get from Santa. I wasn't like, fuck you, Santa, give me these gifts. I was very appreciative. I was very like, I, I wasn't like, I I need, I need, I need. I was like, yeah, this would be good. That'd be good. I'd like this. I'd like that. Oh, right. I was. I, I And I was appreciative of the gifts I got. I, I think the story you started off with, I had a detailed list. Here's I did have exactly a detailed list. Be. I did. I had a detailed list. But as I got to like out of the end of that list, it was like, oh, this would be good too. And that would be good. Because <laughs> you never knew. Because usually what you asked for with Santa, a lot of times you didn't get. So I figured if I just asked for a bounty of things, I'm bound to get some of the things. Uh -huh. So that's how I played it. <laughs> I miss going and seeing Santa at the mall. It was so much fun. Now the, my mall in my hometown just sucks. <laughs> I would, I, I, it does, it's horrible, it's falling apart, like the, some of the major stores are gone, like the store, Santa used to go in front of, I know it's, we're going long on talking about Santa, but it's Christmas, I don't care. <laughs> it's Christmas! Let's read some stories. <laughs> no, it's just, it's a ghost mall. Okay. It is a ghost mall, and I would, I hope it comes back to life, but I doubt it will. We'll, we'll go, like, urban explore it someday, probably. Hopefully. Continuing on. Feel I feel better. I, what's that? You feel better? Not quite, because I'm still bitter about them all. I had a dream about it the other night. Anyhow, I thought about all the toys, pretty clothes, candy, and other cool stuff kids get for Christmas. I discovered by thinking about all of this caused me to gain no progress in getting to sleep, so I pushed the excitement aside and soon fell asleep. That morning, I woke up and, like every normal kid, realized that it was Christmas morning and jumped out of bed as fast as I could. I then ran to my parents' bedroom, where they were still sound asleep, and woke up shouting, Wake up! It's Christmas! They sleepily crawled out of bed and told me to go to the living room. While they went to the bathroom to help themselves wake up, I was anxiously waiting near the tree, staring at all my presents. I knew I couldn't open a present until my parents told me I could, so I just tried to guess what I had gotten. I then walked over to the couch and sat impatiently. At that moment, in front of me, I saw the apparition of a 15-year-old girl holding one of my presents. She then held it out to me and said, here you go, open it. When I told her no, she put it back under the tree. At that moment, my parents walked into the room and she disappeared. When I told my parents what I saw, they did not believe me. 
I don't know that I would have either. I would have <laughs> just assumed it was a kid hyped up on Christmas candy and presents. Yeah, I would not believe it either if I were the parents. I wonder if she ever saw the 15-year-old girl again. It's interesting. Yeah, I wonder if there's any history there with the house or if she knows anything about it or, yeah. There's, if there's more to that, yeah, we would love to hear it. Feel free to, uh, to share more. Uh, 855-853-4802. Is the phone number here at Real Ghost Stories Online. Zach writes in, it was the first holiday without our father and we uh, felt really strange. It was a tossed salad of emotions. On one hand, it was for the best. Our parents just didn't get along. The fighting was terrible and we hid in our rooms as we listened to the bickering. Finally, it was over. They sat us down one day and told us they were getting divorced. We knew it was a good thing and in a way I was relieved. No more listening to the grown-ups acting like children. This is what it felt like. I took charge of the younger kids and I kept them away from the slaps that rang out when daddy and mother lost their tempers. Anyway, daddy moved on and mother, well, she did the best she could, I guess. That first year was really hard, but we tried to find normalcy in every day playing, going to school, you know, just being kids. The first Christmas was a somber affair and we had been told in advance there just wasn't enough money for presents that year. I hope my daddy didn't have much to do with it, but I suspected he wasn't sending much, if any, child support. We were barely getting by as it was. I was a sickly kid. Something was always happening to me, but I understand it all now. As a sensitive with gifts, my body was under tremendous effort. Anyway, not to dwell on that aspect of my story, I want to tell you about the first Christmas we lived without father. My brother was being fitted into a costume. He was going to be playing an angel in the Christmas story. I kept arguing with my mother and telling her the costume wasn't right. Angel wings were bigger, wider, and with large arches where it curved downward. I remember, remember my brother saying, uh, how would you know, he laughed. I was indignant, but couldn't say a thing back. I had seen real angels and I knew what their wings looked like. Who would believe me anyway? So I stayed silent, fuming at myself. The evening progressed. My mother was sitting in her chair next to the doorway of our bedroom. We were listening to Christmas music and reading. All of us kids were lying around in the carpet, quiet for once, engrossed in whatever we were doing. I caught a glimpse of something to my right, so I looked up at the movement. In the doorway to our bedroom stood an old man. He had on high-waisted pants and suspenders and a plaid shirt. I remember blurting out, Who is that man? My mother looked up from her book, and she said, very matter-of-fact, Oh! That's your great-grandfather. That would make him my grandfather. He died before I was born, and he likes to visit during the holidays. I had never seen him around in the past. My brother and sisters were looking at me and mother like we had lost our minds. She went to explain that she had been given just one picture of him, and when he manifested himself, he always appeared in these clothes. What man, my brother spouted? I don't see anybody. One of my sisters tripped up, and by the time everyone was through commenting on what had transpired, the old man was gone. He didn't say a thing. He never lived in this old house and had died in another country. It was the first and only time my mother wanted to discuss the ghost of her grandfather, and she didn't say much. As soon as he was gone, she acted like it never happened. After this, we never discussed the paranormal again. Over the years, I think she liked to think of this as her own little secret. I can't explain it here, but she was a bit narcissistic. I wonder why he showed himself to just me and my mother. Any ideas? Well, I think maybe your mother had the same gift that you have, mm -hmm. and the other siblings didn't. And I hope someday, if I'm ever with one of my girls, and we'll see what you know sensitivity level they have, mm -hmm. if we ever see something together, that I'm like, oh, it's just so-and-so. They only come around certain times or whatever, and I stay calm and ma very matter-of-fact so they don't start freaking out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the answer to that question is really quite simple. It's just he showed himself to you because you were the only two that could probably see him. Yeah. So that's probably the, the simplest explanation. 
uh, 855-853-4802. That's the phone number to call into Real Ghost Stories Online. If you haven't already done so, please press subscribe on whatever platform it is you're listening to us on. iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube. Press subscribe. That helps us out, and you get the shows sent directly to you. Not bad. Dayton writes in. I know people have told many ghost stories, and most people will not believe them. Frankly, I was one of those non-believers when I was younger. Yeah, my family would watch paranormal movies and out-of-this-world kind of things, but who would think that something like this could possibly be real? Watching these shows do not, does not help you when someone you love dearly passes away. I'm the second oldest in my family, and I never would have imagined the feeling of losing a close relative so soon, let alone my own father. A few days after my 12th birthday in December of 2002, my father became very ill. He'd suffered two heart attacks within a year. We had just visited him in the hospital because it was Christmas Eve. All of my siblings and my mother were sitting by his bedside, and he was sitting there, stoic. Of course, we gave him hugs and kisses, but he whispered in my ear to stay behind for a minute, so I did. After everyone left the room, all he said was, I love you so much, my girl. Say, stay strong for them, okay? And I nodded. The next morning, mother went to visit father in the hospital, in my mind. I was thinking, yes, Dad is going to be home for Christmas. I looked at the clock, 5.30 a.m., right on the dot. Phone rings, no name, no number listed. Still, a curious child, I answered the phone even though I was told not to. It was Dad. He was laughing. He said, my girl, I love you. I love sisters and brother and, of course, your mother. Tell them that, my girl. Love you and I'll see you later. And he hung up. I never got to even say a word. He talked, I listened, and that was it. Mom walked in, holding a bag, crying so hard her face was red. She said that Dad had passed away that morning. Everyone started crying right away, and I didn't. I said, no, he didn't. I just talked to him. She explained to me he, uh, that he did and what had happened, even down to when he took his last breath, which was exactly at 5.30 a.m. It took me weeks to comprehend what had happened. I couldn't tell my mother again about the phone call from him. It was beyond too devastating for her. I sat with my father on the last night of his wake. I talked to him and asked him why he left, why he called home and told me what he told me. And last, why he didn't let me say, see you later, back. I know he would never be able to answer me, but still I had to ask him. I adjusted the items we all put in his casket, his favorite Minnesota Vikings cap, his favorite sunglasses, pictures we drew for him, and pictures of us, and of course, my mother's letters she sent with him, properly and propped neatly in the casket. The next Christmas, my mother had gone all out. She bought everything we asked for, even though I told her I didn't want anything. I opened up all my gifts except for one, admiring the bow, the paper, and how neatly it was wrapped. My mom anxiously said, just open it already. I did, and it was a camera. Kind of odd because I just told her the day before that I wished I had a camera to take more family pictures. But the battery and memory card in it made it ready for picture taking time. And that exact moment, I remember what TV show we watched when dad was still here. He laughed at the episode because they were taking pictures and turned off electric devices that had screens on them. He said it was the dumbest thing he'd ever seen. I told him it was cool because of the little dots and the shadows they were getting, but when they uploaded these pictures onto the computer, it would turn the whole thing off and it would no longer work. It's fake, he said. I thought about trying it because it was exactly one year from Dad's passing. I turned the TV off and everyone was looking at me and getting mad because they were watching a Christmas movie. I pointed the camera at the tree and TV. One flash, orbs were everywhere in the picture. No shadows or anything that I could see on the camera screen. Nothing that looked like father, just orbs. Second picture, I pointed the camera at the TV screen. Like I said, I was already it was already turned off. All you can see on the camera screen is a flash on the TV, and that was it. All my siblings and even my mother told me it was a dumb idea to turn the TV back on, so I did. The next day, I wanted to see the pictures on the computer, blow up the pictures to see if I caught anything. I sat down and plugged my camera in. And to my surprise, the first picture I caught was a shadow behind the tree, along with the orbs that were floating around the tree. I showed my mom and siblings. They laughed and said it was fake. The second picture, I magnified the picture on accident, and it zoomed into the middle of the picture under the flash. I jumped out of my chair and ra ran to grab my mom. She came to the computer, and she saw it. 
Right when she got close enough to the computer, she started crying. I caught a perfect picture of my father's face right under the flash on the TV screen. I showed my siblings that picture and they all had tears in their eyes. And that was when I remembered or reminded them of that phone call from him exactly one year before. I said that now they can believe me. I don't have to hide this secret anymore. They hugged me and said it was the best Christmas gift I had ever given. Of course, the next morning, our computer had broken before I had even gotten time to email it to my other family members. I went to look at my camera, and it was hot. Batteries were taken out, and the memory card was literally fried. I couldn't believe it. Brand new computer and camera broken in a day. To this very day, my siblings and I remember and talk about it as if it were just the best thing, which in our case it is. We no longer have our mother as well, and more stories will be written about them both. Trust me, there's more. My parents always told me that when someone passes away, they never die. They rest. And you're not ever supposed to say goodbye. It's always, see you later. R.I.P. to my wonderful father. This one will always be his story, but ours to share. I really like how well that story was written. Yeah. I'm glad that they were able to see that he was still with them. Mm-hmm. Even if it did kill the camera and the computer. Yeah. I've... Uh... I rarely hear of that happening when people catch stuff that the computers or the device that is captured on is destroyed. Yeah. But that's that's interesting. It's always interesting, too, when you're trying to picture the story in your mind's eye as it's being told uh-huh. before you have a reference point as far as year goes. So I'm sitting there, you know, picturing a camera, and then all of a sudden the words memory card pop up, and it's like, oh, okay, this is more recent than I was thinking. <laughs> so suddenly, you know, the, the image in my mind is, you know, I have an old, like, Kodak camera. I'm not saying, I'm saying, like, 80s or 90s, mm-hmm. you know, film camera. Sure. And I'm picturing that, and, oh, memory card, okay, we're in the 2000s, you know. Mm-hmm. At least, I mean, I, yeah, late 90s had some memory. No, 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 it would have been CD. Or it was, like, built-in memory cards. I don't think there was, like, SD cards back then, was there? I don't have any idea. I don't remember. I remember having a camera that took mini CDs. Oh, really? I still have that camera. It was a nice camera, yeah. And it took and burned literally right onto the thing. And it's a shame. I mean, <laughs> they're, they're difficult to come by these days. But uh, it's a shame. It was a good camera. Actually, a lot of the pictures I've taken around that we have around the house were taken with that camera. Huh. It's a fun one. Anywho. Uh, 855-853-4802 is our phone number. Mackenzie writes in, hey, guys. I just recently started listening to your podcast through word of mouth at work. I love it. Now, I don't usually have paranormal experiences, but one night really sticks out in my mind. When I was five, my grandpa passed away due to lung cancer. We were very close, and I was the last one to tell him goodbye in the hospital. I'm now 20 and still think about him daily. One night, I woke up in the middle of the night with the strangest feeling like someone had just walked in and out of my room. I wasn't, it wasn't an evil feeling, just weird. I sleep with my door barely cracked and look up to see it wide open. I also remember falling asleep with my glasses on and noticed they were off my face and folded up next to me. I was instantly freaked out and got up to check on my son, whose door was also open, and I closed his door at night too. I know he couldn't have gotten up because he sleeps in a crib and has never escaped from it. That night and for the next few nights, I had very vivid dreams of my grandpa. I have a feeling maybe he was just stopping to say he's still there. Sometimes I sense him, but never has it been this strong. I'll definitely write in again if more happens. Thanks for sharing. I think it's the holidays that brings the family members back. Yeah, that's kind of neat. I think so. I think it'd be great if family members just showed up. <laughs> Dead ones. <laughs> it it depends on the family member, I think. Grandpa's invited. Yes, <laughs> your grandpa is always yeah, invited. So is, so is uh, Avis, grandma. She's invited, too. You never met her. No. But uh, assuming she's back into sound mind on the other side and... I think she's probably restored yeah. to her former glory. Yeah. Uh, that'd be fun if all of a sudden they're like, we walk in the other room. Oh, hey, you brought your punch. He always <laughs> made really good punch at Christmas. I really? It was probably, I, I think it was something just really ridiculously simple. I think it was just like seven up and probably a little bit of grapefruit juice and a little bit of orange juice. He was always kind of pinkish in color. Mm-hmm. So, unless it was pink lemonade in there. I don't know. It was good. I, I don't know. I mean, there was kids around, so there wasn't, like, booze in it or anything. Sure. It, but uh, my little cousin Sam, did I tell you that story ever? No. 
Um, well, Sam is now, you know, in his mid twenties. Uh, but at the time when we were all kids, um, at my grandparents' house, they did have like a, a you know, the old milk jugs. Mm -hmm. um, there, my grandpa would put some gin or vodka into that, and he would put that above the punch bowl, out of reach of the children. And that way, if a grown up wanted to have spike their punch in their little cup, they could. Well, Sam got a hold of it, and Sam was about three or four. Oh no! He grabs this thing, thinks it's water, because it's a clear uh -huh. vessel. I mean, it looks like water. Sure. And. That side of the family really doesn't drink a whole lot. I mean, there was, you know, maybe they every pour a little bit into theirs, but that was about it. It's not like there's beer flowing and things like my dad's side of the family. Okay. So it's not something they see very often. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, uh, we look over because all the kids are just playing fairly well behaved bunch. It didn't require tons of supervision. So the kids, you know, are just playing and then Sam's over there and he's, you know, getting some ham or something and then he wants some punch. So he's... Uh, he sees the thing and thinks it's water, grabs it, and just takes the giantest swig of it. And we look over, and like I think somebody said, Sam's got the, the grown-up sips or whatever we called it. I don't remember what we called it back then. And he just looks and he goes, spicy water. Spicy water. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> and then they put it away and... <laughs> That's cute. But, but yeah, it was uh, that was a Christmas memory I'll never forget. It was very, very fun. It's one of those things that, you know, every single year after that was always it was always brought up. That's you know? cute. So that was a fun memory in the basement of my grandparents' house on Christmas Day. So Merry Christmas to all of you. Thank you guys for all of your support uh, in in our first full year. Calendar year. Calendar year. <laughs> and someday I'll figure out calendars and how all those funny things of tracking time work but uh, thank you for all the support this year if you're an epp we thank you so much if you're not one yet please consider becoming one maybe use some of your christmas money and become an epp support the show keep us on the air and enjoy those ghost stories it's only five bucks a month you sign up right now you'll get that email instantly sent to you with all those bonus episodes in it it's about 17 or 18 of them so feel free to start a binge on ghost stories uh, over the uh, the uh, holiday week here because, you know, it, nobody's working anyhow. There's no, very little you can get done. So listen to ghost stories, huh? Until next time, for Jenny Bruski, I'm Tony Bruski. Merry Christmas, and thanks for listening to Real Ghost Stories Online. Do a holiday you. greeting? <laughs> Merry Christmas. There you go. <laughs>